Last week on this program, we introduced principle number three in the 10 Principles to National Renewal series. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'll be joined in just a moment again by Pastor Isaac Crockett. From the first principle of integrity and virtue to the second principle identified by our founders, and particularly William Penn, they all understood it was the nature and the role of God. Principle number three is, as we began last week, the nature of man. Now, last week on this program, we quoted a portion from William Penn in his argument for religious liberty, an address that he said was to Protestants of all persuasions. He said these words, in his words he said this, Christ's own words do plainly teach, says he, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And upon another occasion he expresses himself to the same purpose in almost the same words, for the Son of Man is to come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now who is that is that's lost? Except man. And in what sense can it be said that he is lost? Except by sin and disobedience. It was the sin and disobedience which cast him out of the presence in the garden of God and put him in a condition of eternal misery. If Christ then came to save lost man, he must be understood to save him from that which puts him in a lost condition, and that is sin. For the wages of sin is death, and the servant of sin is a son of perdition. We must faithfully tell people he that commits sin is the servant of sin, from which servitude Christ came to save His people. And it is therefore rightly called, He is, Jesus called, the Savior and the Redeemer. To conclude, Penn said, nothing can be more apparent than that freedom from actual sinning and the giving of the newness of life to the souls of men was the great reason for Christ's coming, for which He hath given us His fullness of grace and truth, grace for grace, and that to be under grace and not under the law is not to have the liberty to do now which ought not to have been done before, or to be excused from former obligations, but to be freed from the condemnation of the law, first through the remission of sins that are past based on faith and repentance, and next freeing us from that weakness by which we were disabled from keeping God's law and then the fulfilling of righteousness of it by receiving and obeying the light and the grace that comes by Jesus Christ." Wow! As Penn indicated and as believed by our founders and preached from the pulpits, the nature of man has nothing within naturally that can possibly lead to freedom and liberty. In fact, nothing about the nature of man, since every man is a sinner from birth and morally corrupt, makes man capable of doing anything righteous without the grace of God, and makes the hope of having a free nation impossible, with the exception of one thing. And that's the fourth tenet of a biblical worldview. There's God, there was a creation and act of God, there was a fall where sin came into the world precipitated by the devil, but thanks be to God, this is the fourth one, there is redemption secured by Jesus Christ. Isaac, I want to ask you, we, we are talking here in this series of principles. We're focusing in this program now about this promise of redemption. Before we explain it, actually, I want to ask you, share just briefly, uh, for our listeners, a little insight into Pastor Isaac Crockett. When did you come in your life at the point where you realized that you were a sinner dead in your sins and you needed help? <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of people, including even my own dad, who talk about being saved out of a very sinful lifestyle, uh, different things they had done that had left permanent scars on them. And I praise the Lord because I was saved from a lot of those things because I was very young. I grew up in a home where my dad had gone through those things, and so he taught his children uh, the truth about it. And he taught those tenets that we've been talking about, about who God is and about who we are. And so I was very young, um, uh, like a kindergarten age, and I had two brothers who were, were all like one year apart. and. Uh, one of us had gotten in trouble. It was probably me. Um, I was usually the one getting in trouble. 
and there was punishment for that and things. And so we were talking about it. We all shared a room. And I had heard the gospel over. I mean, I grew up, my dad was a pastor since I was two years old. He was an evangelist, a preacher before that. So I heard the gospel multiple, multiple times. And it's so simple that even a young child can understand it. And it started to dawn on me. And, you know, as I was asking my brothers about, well, they, you know, that's a consequence, you know, and explaining what. And, um, and so I went, knocked on my dad's door. And, you know, the Bible says, suffer the little children to come unto me. He stopped what he was doing. And explain the ABCs, you know, accepting that we've all sinned, believing that Jesus died and rose again for our sins, and then confessing that uh, to the Lord, asking for that forgiveness. And uh, we went through that, and um, the Lord changed my life even from a young age uh, and has um, been working on my life ever since. So um, we want to talk more about this redemption, the, the redemption that, uh, that I experienced at a very young age. A redemption that uh, I hope you've experienced. If not, hopefully you will listen closely to what we have to talk about today. Uh, we're going to take a brief time out and come back right after that. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping, this is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. We're going to continue now in our focus. This is part two of our emphasis on actually principle number three. As understood by our founders, uh, when they laid down and said, can we start a new nation? Um, the pilgrims referred to this concept of a new Jerusalem or a new Israel. Governor Bradford uh, uh, referred to it as a shining city on a hill. Uh, William Penn referred to it a holy experiment in freedom. This new nation, which we now, as you're watching this program, we're sitting here, these United States of America, this new nation. It's, now it's an old nation, 245 years uh, since the Declaration, 300 years since the pilgrims came approximately or more. They laid down certain very principles that then they said, if we do this, God can bless this nation and we, we're going to trust Him. But they stayed, they, they laid down a foundation and then we're talking about those principles, integrity, and then understand who is God and His nature and His character. But then Scripture clearly takes us to, in the Genesis to this ugly chapter called sin, the fall, where, redemption, where, uh, where the devil tempted Adam and Eve, and then life changed, the whole world changed, all creation changed, and we are now born automatically sinners. It's a big thing to understand. And Isaac, I want to ask you right now, take us back. You share just a little bit about your encounter when you became aware that you were a sinner, and you went through that just briefly. But now let's go back as our founders did. Go back into the pages of Scripture, and go back into Genesis, mm -hmm. and take us to the to the, to the promise that God actually first made where He began to unfold His plan of redemption, which ultimately is what this entire Word of God is all about. Take us back there and build it. What happened? How did God address this calamity when Adam and Eve rebelled against Him and sin came into the world? Yeah, and I love to go back to Genesis for this because so oftentimes we go to John 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus or we go to the book of Romans or Ephesians written by Paul. Uh, but uh, a frequent guest on this program is Ken Ham hmm. and he likes to remind us um, that uh, all things go back to Genesis. And so in Genesis, after the fall of man, when, when Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God's moral standard, very simple standard, just don't eat of this tree, they broke it. Um, in, in chapter 3 where we see that temptation, that fall of man, the curse that comes from God, we also see the plan of salvation, of redemption right there. Uh, 
Genesis 3, verse 15, God says, as a result of this fall, and if you're cursing, the sin curse, um, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, uh, talking to the serpent here, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So right there, we see this struggle with Satan and mankind against God's will, um, that we have uh, this um, right, right there that uh, there's going to be this struggle, this enmity, that the serpent who uh, caused Eve and Adam to fall into sin is going to be constantly, so to speak, coming after us. Um, but uh, this, you know, coming after our heel, but the offspring, the second Adam, Romans describes who that is, that uh, it, by one man, Adam, sin entered the world. By the second Adam, grace came into the world. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to come. There will be one who will come. And that's why Jesus had to come and be born of the virgin, of a virgin. Uh, and he's going to come and he will ultimately, he will bruise a death blow to the, to the head of the serpent. And uh, so that's where we find this redemption already promised in Genesis then in Romans, Ephesians, John, you know, the, throughout the Bible, but especially in the New Testament, we see it explained um, even more. So, Sam, once a person is redeemed by, by accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, realizing their shortcomings and what God has done for them, this grace that is just so amazing and incredible to, to try to imagine, uh, it doesn't mean that everything he or she does is, is righteous. Even though they're declared righteous before God, they've been redeemed. What is required of us to do what God says we should, to do what's right? Hmm. Well, again, we could spend a long time on it, but just a couple <laughs> of principles. We've already talked about it. The Apostle Paul talked about it. I would like to do that, which is right, he said, but boy, I'm always tempted to sin. And that's why we talked about the nature of man is that we are all sinners. It's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. We sin because we're sinners. We know that we're morally corrupt. We are death passed upon all men. We are dead until we are quickened. And, whole, and actually, William Penn, I, were, uh, I mentioned it in the first quote, he actually called about when that happens, uh, the Holy Spirit actually puts mm -hmm. holy motions into mm -hmm. effect in a person's life. What he's talking about, he, the Holy Spirit can quicken us when we come to Christ in faith and repentance. Again, what Penn said. And I, and I quoted from that because it's so clear of what he said. But, um, but he knew, and we need to understand that even though when we trust Christ as our Savior and therefore experience redemption, we still drag around a sin-cursed body. Mm -hmm. And we still, out of our heart, come those things of thoughts and envies and murders. And that's why Christ, well, on the Sermon on the Mount, said, if you think in your heart, if you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder. God, Christ took it right to the heart. Mm. So it's not just our actions, it's our thinking, it's our heart. So it comes within us all the time. So number one is, is understand that we in this life will never be perfect and sinless. Mm. We can be forgiven. Amen. And not under the condemnation of the law, which is what I read from Penn, but we are still, and we live in an evil world. We have to understand we are confronted by the roaring lion that's out there, the devil seeking whom he may devour. Uh, Christ referred to uh, the devil as a wolf in the street. Hmm. But we're also told that we live in an evil world that's sin cursed, that's taking us astray but it done out of the lust of our heart. So we've got a sinful heart, we have an evil world, and we have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Um, we have to understand that we are in a hostile world, and when we trust Christ as our Savior, we understand that we are now Christ, we're told we are pilgrims passing through this world. Our perfect home is not going to be until we get to heaven. In this age, we're going to suffer the difficulties of sin. We are going to confront evil. We've got a real live devil who's out to attack us. We are met by deception. Jesus told the disciples, uh, the mark of the end days are going to be deception. Boy, do we see deception and delusion today, don't right? And he says lawlessness will reign. All of these things come out of the heart of man. We're confronted with these things. So understand, we have to understand those things. And then, and then the third thing, 
is that uh, we have to make every day a choice. Um, Philippians 4, 8 talks about that if we are going to want to direct our thinking and not be caught up in the evil, he said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just and honest and lovely and a virtue, we talked about that, and praise, think on these things. So what can we do about it? We're in an evil world. We're going to fight it all our lives. We have to make a choice. We have to fill our minds and our heart with the things that come from God's Word. We are told to resist the devil because he's ruled, and we're told we're to run from temptation. So there are some very specific things that we are told to do, but understand we are going to be confronted with evil, and if we're fortified, we're told in Scripture that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We don't have to yield to sin, but we will sten. <laughs> so so that's, that's an important, I'll just leave it at that at that point, but I, so I want to take it back to you right now and just have you share uh, with our listeners, because ultimately, as the, what the pilgrims said, they came as missionaries. They came, as they said, for the proclamation of the gospel, mm -hmm. because ultimately it's redemption that changes a heart that can now make citizens, otherwise lawless and, and evil, can move them in a direction where they choose to follow God and do things differently. So explain, explain the plan of sal uh, sal salvation, the plan of redemption to those who are look, listening to us right now that say, well, maybe, you know, maybe I've never heard this before, or I'm not quite sure how you do it, or Isaac, tell me again, what happened to you when you went into your father that night? Uh, share that. So you just said that, you know, redemption is a change in our heart or in our, you know, who we are thinking. Uh, in Romans, written by somebody who was very, very religious, trying to work his way to heaven, um, but he didn't understand what God had done for him in grace until one day on the road to Damascus, mm -hmm. Saul became Paul. Paul wrote this in Romans, um, Romans chapter 3, he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what we discussed on the last program, the nature of man. But he goes on in verse 24, he says, But we can be justified freely by His, Jesus, grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's that word, redemption. I think real, real quickly of a story um, from many years ago, there was a rich uh, banker. His mother was poor, lived in a little village, and he kept sending her money, and he kept getting reports back that she's, she's living in poverty, and she has no money. And so he finally goes to visit his mother one day, and he realizes the problem, and it comes back to this idea of redemption. The money that he had been sending to her was in the form of bank checks, and she had never redeemed those checks. In fact, she was very proud of those checks. She had them on her wall like wallpaper, but she didn't realize that she could redeem those for value of money, that she could buy things to fix her house up, to eat better food. And, uh, and so she had all this work had been done for her, but she never redeemed it. She never cashed it in. And so God, John 3, 16, Jesus tells Nicodemus, he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That was Jesus was going to be that sacrifice. That whosoever believeth in him doesn't have to perish, go to hell, separation from God. We talked about eternal death in one of our recent programs, but have everlasting life. Redemption brings everlasting life. Jesus did the work. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul explains, it's by grace, by putting our faith. That's where, you know, we have the ABCs. We accept that we're a sinner. We believe that Christ died for us. We confess it. Um, that's our faith in, in Jesus Christ. And so um, it, it sounds simple, but it, it takes a big step to, to make that life-changing decision. Now, Sam, in, in the introduction to this, you've been quoting William Penn a lot, and some of the, the quotes that you've read from him are really amazing, his spiritual understanding and biblical worldview. Um, do you happen to have any other appropriate quotes from William Penn that apply to this discussion? I do, Isaac, and this is again for our, for our viewers. Uh, understand, this was from Penn, but our founders, many of them, said the same things. Here's one. Penn said, I would to God that people would but consider what they pray for. They both ask and neglect and revile the substance of their own prayers. They pray, Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done, but they don't believe either. It was the office that God designed His Son to. The thief, says Christ, does not come to, but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. 
that is to steal away the heart from God, and to kill and destroy all good desires and inclinations of the soul. For the devil is the thief and destroyer. But I am come, says Christ, that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. Again, O death, I will be thy death. I will kill that which killed the soul. I will breathe the breath of life into it again, and by my spirit and grace I will beget holy motions and kindle heavenly desires in it after God, after the kingdom of God and the righteousness thereof. He said, this is the newness of life, and I will not only restore that life the soul has lost, but I will increase it. I will add to it that it may have life more abundantly, more power and strength to resist evil and embrace and delight in that which is good. Indeed, Jesus was anointed of God for this very purpose, and is therefore called the restorer of paths, the repairer of breaches, and the builder up of waste places. That is, He, Jesus Christ, ordained of God for the recovery of man from his fallen and disobedient state. This is the reason for His name. Thou shalt call His name Jesus, said the angel, for He shall save His people from their sins. That's William Penn, off the pages of Scripture. We'll be right back. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Sam, as we've been looking at redemption, we saw you know, last week the nature of man and we built upon it this week. You started the program asking me you know, how I came to have that saving knowledge of God, that, that redemption. Let me turn that back around on you and, and could we hear uh, how the Lord uh, saved you? Certainly. You know, um, my father was not a pastor like yours was, but, uh, but my experience um, when I came to be aware that I was a sinner. Um, and, you know, that's the great thing about it, Isaac. Every person has to come to a point where they realize they are dead. <laughs> um, and, 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 and they are a sinner, and we need something or someone more than ourselves. Um, I was in church every time the doors opened. My father was very faithful, and we went. And I heard the Sunday school lessons. I heard preaching. But it was at a week after a week of revival services, which a lot of people watching right now said, what's a revival service? We don't have them anymore, hardly. But a week, an evangelist, an old-time traveling circuit-riding preacher, the last one in the country, mm. uh, traveled the Smoky Mountains, preached. And he preached a sermon on Friday night on the reality of separation from God, the reality of hell. I was seven years old. Mm. And I could smell the fire. I could smell the smoke. I could feel the heat. And my hands were on the back of the pew, Isaac, as I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, wow, I'm seven years old. I haven't done a lot of sins. I was only seven years old. But I knew this, that if I would have died right then, I would have gone to that place that he was talking about, that Scripture talks about. And when the time came, we asked a question when the heads were bowed. How many of you out there listening to me tonight felt the Holy Spirit touching your heart and would want to put your faith in Christ and trust Christ, God's plan of redemption in Jesus Christ? And I put my hand up. <clears throat> my father put his arm around me and said, do you want to go forward? I said, I do. Mm. And I went forward and my father led me to the Lord. Mm. And I still get broken up over that because I cried like a baby. God saved me, Isaac. Amen. And He will save any one of you if you trust in Him. And that is the wonderful aspect that though we are fallen and sinners, God offered 
Well, Jesus Christ, because he so loved the world. And redemption is what it's called. And when you have citizens and leaders who have experienced the redemption of Jesus Christ, now you're on a track to putting together a nation that can be blessed of God. I'm hoping and praying that you are there. Well, thanks for watching us today. Uh, let us know, contact us. Let us know if God is touching you and helping you in your knowledge uh, through these programs. Pray for us. Consider before God how you can help us financially so that we can continue these programs.